Life isn't perfect, and neither are we. No, but we know how to face our fears. And have some fun. And talk about all the messiest things of life. Like the messiest things. <laughs> get connected to yourself, get connected to others, and get connected to the life right in front of you. This is The Connected Life with Justin and Abby. That's me. That's you. And you. Hey, Connected Life fam, Justin here. And um, <laughs> you guys are probably wondering where Abby's at. She's disappeared for a few weeks um, <laughs> just because I've been doing interviews and stuff like that. Uh, but she's going to be on um, next week. We'll have her. We're going to have a great conversation. We're really excited about that. Um, but uh, between now and then, we're about to get into a conversation with a really good friend of mine, Benji Nolo. He's done multiple uh, films. There was Nefar Nefarious, Merchant of Souls, uh, beyond fantasy raised on porn and the most recent buying her did i nailed all those right yeah i had down in my yeah, notes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but recently um i found out that benji uh has created this uh film this documentary buying her about prostitution and we're going to get into a conversation about that um, but i said hey benji i really want to i want to see this film for myself i would love to have you on the podcast because i believe that um there is a world out there where uh, the hearts of men and women are being utterly destroyed by something that it doesn't have to be this way. Like there can be a course correction. And I think the way that course correction happens in our society is when we take the things in, that's in the darkness and we put it in the light where we actually just start exposing things in through conversations and dialogues, honesty, transparency. Um, and we talk, start talking about the messiness of our humanity. And that's one thing, Benji, that you've been amazing at is having a very healthy conversation about sexuality, pornography, um, um, stuff like prostitution, mm -hmm. sex trafficking, like you're having a healthy conversation and exposing something that oftentimes people feel too much shame to talk about. They don't have the language for it. They don't even know what to do about it. It's just something that we've just accepted as part of our culture. And you're going like, hey, we may have normalized this in our culture, but it's not actually healthy for us. Mm -hmm. Anybody within these institutions of sex sexual degradation towards ourselves and towards others, like this actually isn't healthy. It's very destructive. And so I just love the conversations that you have because they're not deliberately demonizing really individuals. It's like having a conversation just about the destructive uh, power of these things and how they affect us. Would that be a good way to communicate absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and by the way, you run Exodus Cry. Can you tell us just a little bit about Exodus Cry as we jump into rolling here? Yeah, so Exodus Cry is an organization I founded back in 2007, um, and we formed Exodus Cry as a vehicle to fight trafficking. Yeah. And um, so the journey of the past 16 years has really been in that space of confronting and addressing trafficking in a very direct way, but then also looking at what are some of the underlying causes for which this goes on. So the films have been a, a big piece of this equation for us, which we can get into. Sweet. Yeah. Well, I, again, I love what you're doing and going back to buying her and me watching it. So I just want to say a few things. So I watched the film and I thought what I found so powerful was both how men get down the road to to purchasing someone uh, in prostitution. And I think the, the number was staggering, 17 million, um, estimated 17 million men in America have uh, purchased sex. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inside of it. And I was like, wow, that is, that is crazy. And I think what a lot of them don't realize is the reality of the slavery that's happening. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just uh, women who are freely participating in this. These are women who have gone through a journey of co coercion, uh, being mentally broken down and watching um, the journey of how uh, women um, get into it and also how men end up participating in it is just um, incredibly eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot to to take in and it's a lot to unpack. Um, 
the the nature of this issue is just such a tragic like severely tragic issue that i think it's can be wounding to the human soul yeah. to even think about these things and so one of the things i've always appreciated about you is just your willingness to tackle these deeper darker issues of our humanity and to sit with them and you have the tools to process them and mm -hmm. and i've i've always enjoyed you know our conversations the the reciprocity of just being able to share things with you and the wisdom that comes back mm -hmm. and so um yeah i i would love to to jump into the conversation around this film and yeah. and um kind of look deeper at this issue of the, the demand side of human trafficking, which doesn't get talked about very much. Yeah. So where do you want to start with that? I'm happy to go there with you. Uh, I think a good place to start might be just kind of sharing for me what I consider to be a turning point in, in my own personal life. Yeah. Um, so with regards to how I think about and am fighting trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, so I've, you know, um, just a little bit of my background, I was not aware that slavery was an issue on the planet, that it yeah. even existed. I had an amazing history professor in college who was a Shakespearean actor when he was younger, and um, he gave these incredible lectures about slavery. And I always had this thought that, you know, if I was around back then, you know, I would have been an <laughs> abolitionist and it was, uh -huh. um, they were very inspiring. And, um, and so, um, so I didn't have so that was my context, you know, this was something yeah. that happened in history. And the first time that I learned about human trafficking, I read the story of a 15 year old girl named Debbie, who was living with her family in Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, was out on her draw driveway while her mom was inside making uh, making dinner. She was in her sp SpongeBob pajamas out on the driveway and a car pulls up and um, these men jump out and pull her into the back seat. Literally of the car. abductor. Yeah, literally abductor. They blindfold her and put a gun in her mouth and drive her around the city to disorient her and take her to an apartment. And once they get to the apartment, this particular story graphically describes the way that she was gang raped in mm. this apartment and seasoned to be used in prostitution. And then she was kept in a little dog kennel under a bed. Oh my God. Where she was prostituted out through ads on Craigslist um, for casual encounters and for 40 days before... Um, a tip was given to law enforcement and they raided the place and she was rescued. So she's like one person who, whose story we know because she was fortunate enough to be rescued. So I'm sharing that story to say that, uh, the, the violence of human trafficking is, beyond what we can imagine. It is a biopsychosocial disruption and destruction of one's very being. Mm -hmm. And putting that back together is a lifetime of work. So I internalized that story in wow. a way that put, that put this uns, uh, uh, indescribable passion to fight this issue yeah and that led me to a moment where over years that led me to a moment where i remember being in my kitchen one day i can already feel myself getting emotional when i talk about this because it was a very emotional moment um being in my kitchen and the feeling in that season, I, I think I was carrying a lot of secondary PTSD and, um, and I was overwhelmed by the thought of how can I bring an end to this? And also mm -hmm. I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. And I had this picture of this, the globe on my shoulders. Wow. It was like a vision. 
and I, and I just fell down on my kitchen floor and I just began to weep because I felt the deep, deep, deep frustration of, I have to end this injustice and I feel powerless, absolutely yeah. powerless to do that. So I go to the prayer room. I was living in Kansas city at the time. They have a large prayer room there and there's usually dozens of people in there. So it's not, you know, it's, I'm not talking about a prayer closet. Like yeah. this is like a large, you know, sanctuary with dozens of people in it. And I walk in and somebody walks right up to me as soon as I walk in. Mm. And this person put their hand on my shoulder and said, I saw a vision when you walked in of a large globe on your shoulders. Whoa. And this person prayed over me. And, um, in that moment, I realized I, I have to do something, uh, to figure out how to sustain mm. kind of the work in this space because it just felt like paralyzing mm. and crushing. And I'm saying all that to say that the angst of that drove me to the point of mm. developing a solutions-based approach to fighting human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So moving away from the idea that we're somehow going to magically rescue every person on the planet and magically expunge, you know, all the things that are happening to get people in those places. Like I, I moved away from magical thinking into more realistic thinking about solutions to end this. Right. So and by the way, I want everybody to be rescued. I often have visions of myself carrying people out of brothels and they're burning in the background. Like, you know, most mm -hmm. men that touch this <laughs> issue, like, right. <laughs> like those, those, um, ruminations are real. Yeah. And, um, so just, okay. So coming back now, um, uh, and, um, so long story short, that is what, drew me to the place of looking at the demand side of human trafficking. Again, all this happened over years. This wasn't, this didn't happen in a, in a day or two. This was over years, drew me to the point of looking at the demand side of the equation. Yeah. Which by the way, I want to add something, the feeling that you felt when you connected to the reality of the pain of what happened with that girl, what's happening in the world, all of that stuff. A lot of people avoid having a conversation around this or looking at things like this because they feel that feeling they feel the inability they're like there's nothing mm -hmm. i can do which mm -hmm. makes sense which i'm going to tell you a little story mm -hmm. myself about my world here later in the podcast it just happened yesterday mm -hmm. um but it is it's 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 this overwhelming sense of like oh that feels so hopeless i can't do anything which i what i love is that inside of you there was something that flipped and you're like but I am going to do something. Mm -hmm. There has to be something that I can do to participate inside mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. And uh, we'll get further into that. So anyways. It, and you know, when you're in that, when you're experiencing that level of desperation, you're not objectively analyzing your own process and thinking, how can I preserve my own self through this? That's not what's happening. Like for me, like I, <sighs> it's it it stirs up a lot of emotion when i think back on that season because it was like a really intense mm. season of um I, I feel like just in a way almost being gifted a, a burden for this issue but um yeah it was like difficult to sleep at night mm. or waking up at night to go pee and instantly your mind being flooded with there are people out there. So it's, um, so I think like what was driving me was this desperation, uh, that this horrible thing is happening to people. And, um, so trying to really balance that with, uh, becoming more aware of my own humanity and limitations and the humility of that. And then, um, and then trying to, to kind of balance those, both of those things in discovering 
where the real work would would take place yeah. to end this. One perspective that was super helpful for me and one that I like to share often is um, the idea that there's value in, you know, helping one person. Yeah. And um, yeah. because I think part of it was just like the scope of this, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that there's 42 million people, like the scope was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So there's this quote from Mother Teresa. She said, had I not picked up that one child in Calcutta, I never would have picked up the 42,000. Wow. And so wow. that idea of going after the one was one of the first things that started to settle me. It started to, to calm my nervous system a little bit. Like, okay, I can make a difference in the life of one person. And then right alongside that, there's a passage in the Jewish Talmud that says, he who saves one life saves the world entire. So mm. the idea being of the infinite value in every human life. And so it was this idea that I can make a difference by impacting one person's life and that that has infinite value. Mm. Those two things really like calmed my nervous system. Right, because the enormity of having to take on it, you're like, but I can start with one. Exactly, yeah. And um, and then so that started a trajectory that led me down a path, um, which you know eventually we can get into, uh, of looking more realistically at what I could do to impact this issue, but. Um, yeah, I obviously still carry a lot of just trauma from, you know, this, this issue. And, um, I know, yeah. I know that, you know, on the note of the trauma, like, thank you for your vulnerability of that as well. And, and just allowing that to be part of this conversation. Um, some of my most traumatic one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions have been with people who have participated in trafficking and prostitution and, <laughs> And being there to hear the depth of the abuse that they went through inside of those things that they were subjected to. I remember walking out of consulting sessions and finding my friend Blair in his office and just weeping mm. and, and like weeping and falling to the ground because of the level of the reality of what I just heard about. Mm. And when you connect with the reality that this is multiplied by 42 million mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this type of abuse this mm -hmm. type of whatever and you get a firsthand look into um like like the work that you've done there's a firsthand look there's these conversations you've, you've been in the middle of it there's so much secondhand trauma with it mm -hmm. and it can be debilitating and one of the things that's really beautiful is the places where you haven't tapped out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In part, to, like the, the the fact that most people can't even hear a conversation, let alone like like just a light conversation about it, let alone mm -hmm. be involved in the middle of it, I think it's it's pretty profound that you're mm -hmm. still standing mm -hmm. on the other side of all the investigations you've done. Well, I've been one of those people in your counseling room that's left sobbing, <laughs> so I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. And you have a unique way of opening people up and. Uh, helping them work through deep trauma. And um, I'm really grateful for that because mm -hmm. we need those. There's a lot of uh, emotional congestion and psychic congestion in, in this field. And uh, it's, it's really helpful to have healers creating yeah. space for us to work through some of this. And it, yeah, it's a big part of the reason why I'm still going. Um, but um. Yeah, I I had a thought of where I wanted to steer this with it, but I don't care. I lost the train of thought. No, um, you're you're totally okay. As you've as you've been unra unraveling all of this and mm -hmm. and seeing it firsthand, like I hear that you were able to get like the idea of one person. You could take care of the one person, and mm -hmm. that could start the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. um, as you began that journey mm -hmm. and you got some relief. Mm -hmm. um, where did you find yourself going from there? Okay. So there's one other component. Um, so, so there's like, I would say four maybe primary components 
to what kind of changed changed the trajectory of my season and focus and emphasis. And um, one of those was the idea of being able to go after the one, the value of that. The other was taking a more solutions-based approach. Mm -hmm. The third was uh, working with healers, therapists, counselors, healers, yeah. to create that uh, space to offload yeah. and and evacuate a lot of the feelings of that were um, really traumatic to to carry. Yeah. And then the fourth. And, you know, I'm just going to share this because it's part of my story and I don't mean to alienate any of your audience with this story, but this is probably the biggest component for me. Um, and, you know, I realize our conversations has sort of built here around this idea of perseverance and sustaining um, an effort to fight injustice that wasn't exactly what I <laughs> necessarily planned for this conversation, but I think since we're going there, I'll just yeah. mention this last I love kind it. of piece. Um, a friend of mine had a, had a vision, um, and in it, she, so she was in prayer and in it, she was taken up into heaven and I'll just say it like <laughs> this yeah. was her experience. So, yeah, um, I love it. you know, Again, for your audience, do what you will with that. But this was an experience that was very profound and also mm -hmm. changed her life mm -hmm. as well. She had this years ago, and she, in it, she's in a she understands this place she's in as the Father's house, Father God's house, mm -hmm. and she's being given a tour of all the different rooms. And there's the spiritual wine cellar, and uh, lots of people in there becoming intoxicated in the presence of God. And there's the spiritual library and lots of people in there mm -hmm. filling their minds with the knowledge of God. And eventually she comes to the um, intimacy chamber. Mm -hmm. And she said she was surprised by two things. One, that nobody was in there. And two, mm -hmm. that it was the most beautiful, ornate room in the whole house. And, mm -hmm. um, and so she was just admiring this, this intimacy chamber. And, um, and she's being given this tour by Jesus. Wow. And she notices next to the bed that there's a little wooden hatch doorway. And she th th thought, she said she thought that it felt out of place in this room. So she asked Jesus what's down there. And he said, oh, um, well, that's where I spend most of my time. Mm -hmm. He said, that room's called the weeping room. And she said, um, my curiosity was stirred. And I said, well, if that's where you spend most of your time, then I want to see what's down there. And he said, well, you have to get very low to get through the door. And mm. he leads her over there. They open this little hat next door where they have to crawl to get through. And then there's a wooden staircase that leads down into a room that had windows on all sides. And she said that there was a single chair and he sat down in this chair and she said that instantly she understood why it was called the weeping room because you could see every injustice on the planet and you could hear the groaning of every person who was suffering. Mm -hmm. And she described graphic things that were, that you could hear and see like rape that was occurring. And she said she began to weep and she said she wept for hours and hours in that place, but not just because of the injustices that were happening on the planet, but because of this beautiful king who would spend his time in that place. And so for me, like hearing her, hearing that experience answered this deep cry in me, which was, God, where are you? Like that was a very real thing for me for a long time because I was like, I feel like so broken over like what's going on on the planet. And I'm like trying to be 
a person of faith, but I'm like, God, where are you? And, oh, and there's that, that question of like, why do you let evil exist? Why do you let suffering exist? I still don't know the answers to that, to those questions. But one thing I do know is that God has entered into the vulnerability of experiencing the suffering of those places. And he has put me on this earth to stop it. And so I think for me, that fourth aspect of solidarity was mm. so important to realize, like, I'm not in this alone. Yeah. And many times in this journey, it's the desperately lonely. Um, I never knew what depression was. Like there's days where I've laid in bed for 18 hours mm -hmm. um, and just played worship and literally held on every word. Like I remember this one week I was in bed about 18 hours a day and I had Jason Upton playing all day, every day. And I was literally hanging on every word and, um, and then I get a text from him and he says, Benji, I just want you to know that you mean the world to me. <laughs> and like just <laughs> like little pinpricks of light like that, like little rays of light like that um, to pull me out of those dark places. Like this isn't what humanity was created for. Like this is not what we were supposed to experience. And, um, and so... Um, so I think for me now, um, being able to have that solidarity with God to sort of answer that deep existential question of where are you has been like a really powerful healing, sustain sustaining element to staying in the work to take a solutions-based approach to end this injustice on the earth. And... Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of like where I'm at right now. Well, I'm obviously messed up listening to that. I think that... And by the way, I've never shared some of those things before. I'm not really open or vulnerable about my own times of depression. Um, but it is, yeah, it has become part of my life experience in a way that I never, ever experienced before. So. I really appreciate your vulnerability in that, Benj. Um, because it's honest and it's authentic because it's not just, oh, I can just plow through anything. Like when we touch on the reality of the, how dark humanity can get to participate in bringing resolution, there is an effect that takes place. And one of the things that you're talking about is like, in order to actually walk that out, I actually had to be very aware of a connection with this creator who's inside who's in the midst of our messiness and not only is very aware hasn't abandoned us but is also participating in the suffering mm -hmm. like the idea that there is a god that loves humanity so much that will feel the weight of the fullness of mm -hmm. our suffering while mm -hmm. we're been given this free will to do the things that we do Mm -hmm. And the the free will to be able to choose love or to choose destruction. And, and he's in the midst of it going like, hey, you're actually not alone. Yeah. And, and, and I'm here to partner with anyone who's willing to partner with me to bring resolution on earth. And I think that that's even one of the most powerful parts of this conversation already is, is like to anyone who's like listening in on this, like when you start to say yes to um, participating in healing injustices in the world, whatever that is, whether it's one person or it's a dozen or thousands of people, whatever, whatever level of participation you're in, there is a good dad who goes, that's exactly what I'm in the business of. Mm -hmm. I'm in the business of righteous justice, righteous restoration, righteous redemption. And that's where like the strength actually is able to be pulled from. Cause otherwise you can't, you can, I don't know anyone that can truly do it and not be completely broken, yeah. uh, 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 devoid of a relationship with God. Yeah. hundred percent. Because it's so taxing on the soul. Yeah. And I also like, um, the reality of like you 
are here and walk through that depression um, and are continually wherever you're at in that process is you're holding on through every step of your journey with someone who's going like, hey, I'm here to repair your heart too. It's not just take care of everyone out there. I want to take care of your heart, Benji, in the middle of this process is what I'm taking from what you're saying. Yeah. 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 It would not, when Jason sent me that text, it felt like words from heaven and, yeah. um, to that, that, to, to feel seen mm-hmm. in that place was, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really important for my own like survival. And, um, I think that when you're yeah. talking about that, it has been a question inside of me because you've, you've gotten very deep into the uh, conversation with the porn industry, right? Mm-hmm. And just that, like, like the, the videos I've watched uh, of the conversations you're having with people in that industry that are so broken. Like yeah. I, I, to, to me, I'm like, I don't know how yeah. Benji can survive each in-depth conversation yeah. that he's had inside of it. Yeah. For, and for different reasons, because some of the people that we interviewed are true sociopaths and others are just their lives have been destroyed by these sociopaths and both are traumatizing in different ways. So right. navigating that space was really challenging. And so to just kind of, so somebody asked me recently, just to kind of wrap up that, that story, somebody asked me recently, what, what, what do, what can we do? What do we, what is needed? And, um, as I thought about that question, obviously there's a lot of things that come to mind that are more practical, Mm -hmm. but on a deeper level, I felt the, the, the thought that came to me was, um, that Jesus needs more friends Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who think Jesus is their homie. Um, but, or there's so many different views of, um, but the idea of friendship is tarrying with someone in the place of their deepest pain and being willing to sit in that place. Mm. And, I was reminded of this story when Jesus is facing the reality of the the cross Mm. and he goes into the garden of Gethsemane and the stress is so intense. He's literally sweating blood and he invites his closest friends to be with him in that place. And all of them fall asleep. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, I don't know where this is theologically, but I feel like in some ways I've touched the lonely heart of God, like a part of God's heart that is alone in that weeping room facing mm. and experiencing that. And like the the beauty of being invited to that place of friendship is worth dedicating our whole life to. Mm. And um, there's a, a beauty in and a quality of love and entering into true friendship with Jesus and going with him into Mm. the hardest, darkest places and helping the most vulnerable, marginalized, oppressed, victimized people on earth. It, It sounds really dark. There's an aspect of it that is dark, but I have found something in the heart of God in that place. And it's deeply intoxicating. And I, um, I just want my, I just want you to have more friends. I want more people to not see their life just simply through the lens of this self indulgent, um, you know, um, paradigm, but to realize that there is meaning and purpose and joy and fulfillment that comes through laying your life down and, it's just like this idea that like you can't find your life until you give it up. Yeah. And um, so I'm not perfect at this. Like I'm sharing these things as somebody who's on this journey myself. Yeah. But um, 
I've touched something in the heart of God that has sustained me in this fight. And I just feel at this moment really deeply encouraged by uh, where he's brought us to in this fight. Yeah. And we are actively seeing God move against the systems of injustice that have wow. per been perpetuating the, the victimization of so many lives. And it's um, pretty like awe inspiring to, to see that. What are ways that you feel like you're seeing that? Like, is there some examples that kind of pop up inside of you when you say that? Well, so for example, I had a friend who was in Cambodia and um, he had gone undercover to investigate a chain of brothels wow. and, um, and discovered that there were 2,000 children being trafficked in this <sighs> network of brothels. The biggest trafficker in the nation at that time was the chief of police. And the way things work in Cambodia is you have to have a raid approved. It has to go up the chain of command. Wow. Otherwise, if if you raid a place, they'll just it will all be undone and it'll be worse. And so um so he sends the the evidence up the chain of command. It gets shut down because of this chief of police and he's completely dejected and he emails me and he's like you know can you guys pray for us so we mobilize a prayer meeting for you know there's uh, every monday night we had this prayer meeting there were several hundred people wow and um and we we just uh labored in intercession and travail for breakthrough and um and about two or three days later he emails me back and he goes, Benji, I think you prayed somebody to death. And, you know, I'm like, where is this going? And like, <laughs> I, I just for clarification, I don't ever pray for people to die, but, um, but he goes, the chief of police was riding in his helicopter this week when it was struck by lightning and he was killed instantly. What? <laughs> what? So, you know, situations like that, where it's this idea that uh, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he does rejoice in establishing justice. And in Psalm 76, it says, the earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment mm. on behalf of all the oppressed of the earth. Mm. So there's this picture where God stands up, these moments where he stands up. And all I know is I do not want to be in the way of justice when God stands up from his throne. And most recently, um, there's a couple other like really significant things that have happened. Um, most recently, we released this hardcore episode of our Beyond Fantasy series. The main person in it is a man named Max Hardcore, who's a, uh, you know, uh, he's a, he is a, true sociopath like yeah. clinical sociopath who thrives on sadistic perpetrator abuse and um and he's drinking that heady wine of the uh robbing of a person's innocence and destruction mm -hmm. of their soul and delighting in that and so we released this episode that features him I in this that, abusive content yeah he gets hospitalized hours later and dies three days afterwards. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> so. That is wild. Yeah. So again, like I'm not praying for anybody to die, but like I just look at so many things that have transpired in this work that we do. And it's, it's deeply humbling. Like what I do is I suck carpet after those moments because I'm like, I'm not perfect. I'm like, you know, and I'm like, I feel like Isaiah, right? Like, what was me of a man of unclean lips? Like, I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh man, I, it, you know, I, it's just, it's so sobering. Yeah. The reality of that. Um, and so in this current dispensation of time, it still appears in many ways like evil is having its way, but there is still one in heaven who holds the balances of this mm. planet in his hands. Mm. Two thirds of the angels are still with him and he still has a sovereign plan to bring about, you know, his ultimate victory in humanity. And 
So those moments are just deeply sobering and terrifying. Yeah. Wow. Mm. I was just sitting with that. I was thinking recently, actually, when you're talking about Jesus and the, um, yeah, I know we, we didn't plan on even going down this trail, but mm-hmm. we are mm-hmm. th- thinking, of, you know, you're talking about Jesus uh, in the weeping room and stuff. And Abby and I were having conversations about the idea of God truly carrying the weight, like everything that he's done is to carry the weight of the reality of suffering and that God, God's design is to bring about justice. And there's different expressions of justice, um, obviously. And one is that the human heart is restored. There's mm-hmm. re- restoration for every victimized a uh, person on the face of the planet who's been inside of this. And one and another aspect is stopping the victimizers who are participating in it. And mm-hmm. another is even the hope that victimizers can be redeemed, that, that, that something within them can be restored and that they can actually find themselves at a place of personal repentance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you hear stories like that and you go, um, I don't know what uh, those victimizers uh, experiences are well after they leave this earth. But I can't help but um, know that there's a, um, there's a relief when those victimizers or per- victimizers or perpetrators don't get the free reign to keep perpetuating this. <laughs> and <laughs> though it's not ideal, um, like in the, in the highest level of justice to me is that they could have an emotional redemption, you know, inside mm-hmm. of themselves. Like I feel relief when I hear stories and, and I think that people do of like something got stopped mm-hmm. because we're mm-hmm. all aching. We see the brokenness in the world and there's so many of us that are going, is there going to be something done to stop mm-hmm. this? And I think that one of the things that stands out to me in this conversation is that that wasn't done Aspects of these things being exposed and stopped aren't done singularly by God alone in heaven. There are people like you who are saying yes to participating in the creation of material that would expose things, that would create networks to inspire people to mm-hmm. participate in situations like Cambodia and stuff mm-hmm. like that, like mm-hmm. that are all saying yes to a mandate, an invitation that's like, hey, will you come partner with me mm-hmm. over my ache, over the suffering? the world you will have joy and you will have suffering as well as you participate with me Mm -hmm. but you will have to surrender your right to selfish a selfish lifestyle but the promise is is that there will be uh uh, an echo of repair freedom and justice that will have the potential to reign on earth Mm -hmm. but only if humanity is willing to come say yes to the invitation Mm -hmm. and so that's when i'm listening to it i'm like oh yeah it started like part of those experiences that you can point towards are because uh, partially because of your yes. Mm. Even when you did, you don't know how this is all going to unfold. And it's like, you're living in the grace of each day, just going, I don't know. I have vision for this today. All I have is the capacity today is to mourn inside of depression for 18 hours in my bed. And that's a part of the story as much as it's part of the story of like, Hey, I have the capacity and grace to travel around the United States and promote uh, a movie like Buying Her to expose mm-hmm. the prostitution industry and to get the conversation rolling inside mm-hmm. of people's hearts to help reframe how they think about this, how they see the injustices that are actually happening and how each part of their their participation is adding to the bucket of injustice and where they could actually step out of it and add to the bucket of justice. Mm -hmm. If they'll allow their heart to be moved, if they allow their heart to be convicted, if they're, they will allow themselves to turn from their participation Mm -hmm. in destructive things and Mm -hmm. turn towards constructive construction and Mm -hmm. repair. It's really powerful. It's interesting because when you were talking about even the burden that you were given. I was, I told you I'd I'd share a little story myself. So it's crazy because like last week, um, you know, we had Rebecca Bender on Mm -hmm. and she had her conversation. And then here I have you today having this conversation. So this, this gets to a story that, that was, that sandwiches my week. So this week I, um, Abby and I went in 
she went in or last week she went in to get a massage real quick for mm-hmm. her back in, in, at the mall at this random uh, Asian massage place mm-hmm. that does groups of people, right? So she goes in to get get the massage. I come in and I'm like, oh, I might as well just get one real quick. So this guy gives me a massage and tears my back to pieces. Oh no. Like it, it all jacked up, right? Like in a good way or a bad way? Bad way. Oh no. Like it leaves me going oh, out in a whole bunch of pain. And you I'm need like, to go get a massage to heal from the massage. It's exactly what happened. So yesterday I'm like, I'm, tell, I'm telling Abby, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I cannot move my left shoulder. My lower back is in so much pain right now. And I made phone calls to normal people that I would, you know, like the professionals that I've worked with and no one has space to get in for a whole week. So she's like, I don't know, just drive around, try and find a spot. So I go to a spot in town that I'm looking over in this area, which is by city hall. It's not, it's not, in a, mm-hmm. it's not in a crazy area or anything like that. That's um, shady to my knowledge mm-hmm. and random massage place. It's open. I go walking in there and immediately when I walk in, I'm like, this doesn't feel right to mm. me. It doesn't look horrible in the entrance, but there's like an ATM machine that's in here mm. and there's no one at the front counter. And I'm like, uh, hello. Mm. And a girl walks out that's between 20 and 30 years old wearing a red dress, low cut top, mm. short skirt, Asian, who can mm. barely speak English. And I'm mm. like, are you kidding me? because there's nothing professional about like this is this mm-hmm. is this this looks like i just walked into the red light district mm-hmm. in um oh over in um wherever it is in europe and i'm like so i was like i'm gonna ask her she's like oh you want massage come and i'm like no nah. Can you actually massage? Because I'm like, this is not what this is. So I'm like, I need a massage on my shoulder. It's in pain, lower back. And I'm pointing to each of them. And she's like looking at me and she starts getting this weird face. And I I look because I can see this room over here. And this room has like what would be the massage table, but it's up against a wall, right? Like there's no way anyone's walking around massaging you. Like, and she pulls out a translator and i said no i need a massage for my shoulder and my back and she translates Mm -hmm. back to me uh i only give relaxing massages and you can tell on her face that she knows Mm -hmm. i've walked into the wrong place oh like we we're having this exchange where she's like this guy isn't here for what my clientele comes in for Mm -hmm. and i felt I, i i was like all right have a good day i walk out right and I get on the internet and I'm like, I look up the name of this place and I'm like, how does this exist? This is in Redding, California. Like, this is blatant. And as I look, I, I look up the name of it and I find that it, um, that a- after you scroll past the first pictures on Google, this is, this is on Google reviews. You see all these young Asian girls. Wow. And then I go to the reviews, which it has 17 five-star reviews. And I start reading the reviews. I was like, what, what is, who's visiting this? What's going on? And it explicitly says from there, yeah, our girls change monthly. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So then I call Rebecca Bender. I was like, you got a hotline? Do we got anything? Like they're clearly being trafficked right here. Mm -hmm. They're being trafficked through this exact spot. She gives me a number. She goes, call the local police. I call the police in Redding, California. I'm getting somewhere with this. And I said, do we have a force to deal uh, like a special force or anything, any organization locally to deal with trafficking and stuff? Like, and the officer says, look, man, I'm just going to be straightforward with you. We got seven police to deal with this entire city. Mm. And he says, so our officers aren't, we're not equipped. Like during the day, we've got seven people on patrol during the day. We're not equipped to deal with stuff. And he says, Furthermore, just to be straightforward, we know they exist. We got like, he says, we got like 50, around probably 50 massage parlors in town. And most of them are dealing in prostitution. Mm -hmm. And he says, and prostitution is a misdemeanor in California. So it just exists. And if you want to do something about this, you're going to have to call city council because they're over deciding, helping decide 
who's getting business licenses because we keep handing out business licenses to anyone and just letting them get away with having letting these businesses run inside of this city. So I called my friend on city council and I said, I said to her, which she's a, she's a ball buster. I was like, this is what I just encountered over here. And I started, and I also started looking on the internet and I found that I found the other, I found like multiple other ones, same type of reviews, same type of pictures. And I was like, I had no idea this was in our backyard. Like I, I've had clients come to me and tell me that they've had happy endings and we've had to process through some of that. And I was shocked at that. I'm like, how does that even happen here? Mm. But I'm like, it is so blatantly in our backyard. And I felt that emotion that you felt, which is like, first off the overwhelm mm. of like, I don't know how to stop this. Mm. I don't know what to do about this, but I can't turn a blind eye from what I just saw inside of this experience. And I, I was talking to Abby today about it, you know, and she was like, it is so crazy that you just did the meeting with Rebecca and you're about to sit down with Benji and you got this exposed right in front of your face with this whole thing. But I was like, I have to, and, and so again, going back to, um, sorry, going back to mm -hmm. the city council member, she was like, we're going to do a full blown takedown of this. We're going to work together. She's like, we're going to find solutions. If nothing else, we're going to put such exposure on this when I get back mm -hmm. from my trip mm -hmm. uh, to the entire city, the city, the city council will get in conversation with mm -hmm. the city attorney. Like we're going to do what we need to do to make sure it, if nothing else, our city is highly aware of what mm -hmm. exists inside of this town and move from there, which I'm like, maybe that one phone call in the beginning of that is what starts it, you know? Mm -hmm. But I like at some level, again, I felt that paralyzation of like, this is so big. Mm -hmm. This is so immense. Mm -hmm. How do you do this? But it was the idea of like, I'm going to take whatever step inside of me that I know to take because I can't sit and go back to life as normal, mm -hmm. knowing that that girl that I saw is among many who are being swapped in and out, obviously mm -hmm. for prostitutional purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, well, that's a whole, the, the massage parlor reality, it represents a whole kind of hardwiring uh, of our planet mm. in term, just like the internet is hardwired and baked into the planet now mm -hmm. so are massage parlors um they the, this is one of the the primary manifestations of tra uh, trafficking that occurs and um you know just under the radar yeah and um and so there are vulnerable demographics of people living in asia who are preyed upon by these larger multinational trafficking rings who have chains of, of massage parlors. And they're also very aware that mm. any uh, investigation that is actually going to be prosecuted by a DA is going to take longer than a month to yeah. put together. Wow. So they move the girls. They have a whole stream of them moving from massage parlor to massage parlor to massage parlor to keep the law enforcement disoriented and to keep the girls disoriented about where they are and what they're doing. And these systems of uh, trafficking go on and on and on. And it's, and, and it's, you know, for a lot of people out there that would say, well, you know, where does this happen? You know, Thailand. And it's like, well, yeah, it happens in Thailand. Um, but it's also happening right here in Redding, California. Yes. Like the Redding is a small town in the middle of nowhere. Like 100,000, 90 to 100,000 yeah. people. And it's and it's very prominent. Trafficking is very prominent here. So this gets back to the conversation of the film Buying Her that we're touring with right, right now, which is the demand side of the equation. So yes. the best way to understand trafficking is in terms of where does it happen is anywhere there is a demand yeah so i'd love to pull on that thread but i just wanted to just kind of wrap up what we were talking about earlier with regards to perpetrator accountability and um you know for these people who are uh malevolent sociopaths that are preying upon 
other people, mm -hmm. um, the sobriety that I feel for them is mm. God is merciful. Mm -hmm. Um, but you are engaging your life in a way that leaves no safety for you. Yeah. And that is a terrifying place to live. Yeah. Your years may be extended or they may be cut short, but one day you will stand before God. Yeah. And, um, and so, um, in these certain situations that we've been in, these are situations where I believe God has, you know, using the language of Psalm 76, stood up from his throne to bring about judgment on behalf of the oppressed of the earth. He has moved against these systems of injustice. And if you're an individual who is perpetrating that injustice, um, that's not a safe place. And, and so, uh, so yeah, so it's, um, it's a sobering reality to stare at. Um, but coming back to the point of, you know, the demand side of the equation, yeah. um, if that's something you want to talk that, about, I'd love to I very much want to talk okay. about, cause I did want to circle back to this. Okay. Go ahead. Cause yeah, I mean the demand and, and that's part of like, in my head, I was like, because you and I have had conversations about the idea of the demand. Mm -hmm. Like if there's no demand, like why are they going to traffic? They're not going to mm -hmm. traffic girls in Redding, California. They're not going to traffic girls in America if nobody's buying the girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the the sobering parts of uh, buying her mm -hmm. that it gets into is the reality mm -hmm. that this, is, this, this isn't um, necessarily a problem with the prostitutes like you mm -hmm. they used to have a thought process of like prostitutes are the problem and then they got convicted the prostitutes when it's like mm -hmm. the johns mm -hmm. it's us the men who are creating this demand who are engaging it who are choosing to bury our heads in the reality mm -hmm. of the porn industry the trafficking industry that we're not actually looking at how our actions inside of our hearts are um tearing apart society and humans. And I think that mm -hmm. this is something that you do such a fantastic job about talking about, which is like, hey, the solution begins with men mm -hmm. and men deciding to either get healing for mm -hmm. the parts of themselves that feel so broken that are engaging sexuality in broken ways. Um, or yeah, anyways. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. It, it, I, 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 it's, this is, <sighs> You know, the substance of this part of the conversation is where I think we can make the most traction yeah. on this. And in order to qualify the what we're talking about with demand, um, I want to just hit a couple bigger picture thoughts first to kind of frame this up a yeah. bit. So um, first of all, it's important to think about the impact of... Um, sadistic perpetrator abuse on individuals who are in these trafficking systems. Mm -hmm. I'm reading a book right now called The Alchemy of Wolves and Sheep. And one of the, it's about internalized perpetrator abuse and the trauma of that. And what this book gets into is, in terms of examples of um, case studies mm -hmm. are like child soldiers. So, um, you know, a, a child who has been plucked from their local community, their local tribe, and then shown several of their peers brutally murdered. Yeah. And then offered the same outcome for themselves. Or here's an M16. Here are your parents kneeling down in front of you. You can kill them and live. Mm. And so, um, enacting in those children this violence that mm. they have been seduced into and coerced into complicity with. So there's like a complex trauma that occurs in those situations that's very difficult to repair in a, in a person. Yeah. I'm just citing this as one example, but the similar type of thing occurs in the life of somebody who is trafficked 
and the the um the uniquely sadistic aspect of preying upon seducing manufacturing coercing consent and complicity and collusion from the individual who's being trafficked and the participation in their own degradation mm. and humiliation and violation so there's a unique trauma that is invoked through that that is complex and uh fragmenting and soul destroying and so i want to mention that to say that there's a very good reason for which we want to go after the demand um of course yes we want to bring an end to this but the reason we want to bring an end to it is because the the implications of somebody who's perpetrated against in this way are so destructive yeah. and takes so much intensive effort i mean there are a handful of therapists on the earth that even have the capacity and the knowledge and the skill set and the calling to deal with these types yeah. of individuals um that work is extremely difficult and so for you know our male audience that's listening to us a lot of them would think about like man well how do we go you know let's go you know burn this you know massage parlor to the ground or whatever and we'll get all the girls out mm. okay that's great but then what i mean yeah. it's not great i'm not saying go burn down a I just got to qualify that. But you know what I mean? Like that <laughs> totally. we get that we get this idea of if we could just eliminate it and burn it to the ground right. and like yeah. Okay, that's that we're great. We stopped this injustice. No, we didn't because you have not dealt with the root. You haven't dealt with the root and now you have all these girls to deal with. So running out of the brothel with it over your shoulder with them isn't enough. Like this is what we see from people who come back from um having experienced, you know, torture and war or some type of uh, traumatic you know PTSD uh from from war um how then what do we do with them yeah what do we you know like, yeah because what they, happens they, to those people they need repair after after all that and so and if you're only grabbing hold of and and, and again we want to get people out of it right but if you're only grabbing people out of it but you're not getting rid of the demand they just get more supply somewhere else exactly which more people get added into it exactly and um and so that that elevates the importance of, of doing the work to bring an end to this and so i think it's important to frame it that way um to, because it yeah it just it does put so much greater urgency on tackling the demand side of this equation and that is the subject of this film that we did called buying her which we're touring with right now it's the first documentary ever made about male sex buyers. Wow. And it stems from our my four-year investigation of global sex trafficking um, when I was traveling around the world and across four continents, 19 countries and 42 cities investigating global sex trafficking and realizing that if you know this very simple equation 99 98% of the people being sold are women and children 99% of the ones doing the buying are men wow. and if men stop buying women and children for sex we would this sex trafficking would end today and we would see the largest exodus of human beings from systematic oppression that the world has ever seen that's it and so um so then we realize, okay, this is a supply and demand issue, but these men are in the shadows. They remain anonymous. They come from every walk of life, yeah. right? They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're yeah. celebrities, they're homeless people. They, they're literally every socioeconomic, religious, political backdrop. There's no discriminating in terms of who is a candidate to become a sex buyer it, yeah. it is you know men from all walks of life growing up in this pornographic culture which is you know another conversation which maybe we can touch on a little bit of that as well but um so that made the work of um examining this 
more deeply, all the more important. And so we spent 10 years seeking these men out, Mm -hmm. finding the men who were healed enough and brave enough and courageous enough Mm -hmm. to get on camera and be extremely vulnerable about their own journey so that we could, you know, um, look at the engineering of how did you get to this point and what do we need to begin to do as a society to begin to rehabilitate mm. men who have grown up in this pornographic culture to to do the hands-on work of rehabilitating and healing men getting underneath the why they're purchasing to end demand but then also um, beginning to shift the pornographic culture to change the way that boys are growing up in this world thinking about women and thinking about sex. And all that work is being highlighted now through this film and Mm. it's catalyzing conversations. Um, We're going into local communities. Our thing is we say, we're not here to indict men, we're here to invite men into a conversation. It's a good way to put it. To explore these issues because um, you can't heal what you hide. Yeah. And so we're trying to call men into the light um, to begin to engage in meaningful conversations around this whole subject. I I love like we're not here to indict, we're here to invite because like the reality is is so many men, especially now, like I remember um getting exposed to pornography at I think it was like six years old or something like that at my aunt's house. There was a playboy under a bed, obviously her husband's. I was playing around in their bedroom and I found it and Mm -hmm. I was looking at it and she comes in and catches me looking at it and I just freak out in a ton of shame. I run out of the house. I go hide down the street, come back later total shame spiral. I Mm. can't really have a con. She's terrified that I'll tell my parents. She's giving me this whole story about how it was here when they moved in. You know, she doesn't Mm. want me to have the conversation out loud that with my parents about it. So that goes into hiddenness, but that Mm. moment ended up dictating a lot of my early on sexuality that happened. And so that was when I had limited access to pornography that that skewed my mind as a young child that affected the way that I behaved. And then we, we have men now that at a young age are being expo- exposed to pornography so much easier and faster. Little boys are having this exposure that's happening. So their, their sexuality is being skewed and it's becoming typical and it's becoming normalized to have these views on pornography and sexuality that are accepting of this type of abuse and relationship with our sexuality that's unhealthy and destructive. And the reason I point that out is it's like, you're not here to shame men. You're here, you're going like, hey, most of you men are being exposed. Mm -hmm. We're not here to indict you. Mm -hmm. We're here to have a conversation about this thing Mm -hmm. that's becoming normalized, this thing that's tragically um, shaking the foundations of your sexuality from a young age that you didn't happily invite into your world. You got it, you got it thrust upon you mm-hmm. through relationships with friends, being around adults that were doing it. It wasn't something that you really had a lot of yes or no to. It just happened mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the things that like, again, going back to, if we can have an open dialogue with men that's non-shaming that says, hey guys, This is how you're being affected. This is a byproduct of how you're affecting the world. It has to end somewhere. We have to begin to make a change somewhere because if we can begin to make that change as individuals, we can begin to crush that demand that's that's existing out there and begin to liberate people simply from repairing whatever's going on inside of us and what got broken inside of us at such a young age. Yeah, and and that 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 work is paramount now. Um, it's not, it's no longer an option. Right. Um, the, the widespread nature of men's violence against women, of rape, of sexual assault. I mean, one in four, one in five girls is going to be sexual assaulted between the ages of 18 and 24. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, that is a talk, you know, if we want to use an an accurate description for the word pandemic Mm. like that is epidemic proportions of Mm. people Uh, sex trafficking is a hundred billion dollar 
a year industry, destroying women and children's lives. What if a hundred billion dollars a year was spent on destroying golf courses? <laughs> you know, like there would be an outrage, outcry, right? <laughs> outrage. But you, destroying women and children, ah, uh, like yeah. it's so. I I think that you know part of part of what we're trying to do is with this film is sound the alarm and it's a and real break the cognitive dissonance that people are mm. engaged in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's for us, it's a, it's, it's a pivot as an organization to begin to focus more hands-on directly um, in terms of the work with men. Um, but it's been a long time in development to get to this point. And, um, and so I think you know part of what we hope to see is the normalization of the work. Men mm. are typically not comfortable with vulnerability um, and emotions and feelings other than anger, and mm -hmm. um, and so it so when these twelve men that we interviewed share their story, it's so raw. It's so they engaged in activity that is uh, so dark that I think it's disarming to other mm -hmm. men because they go, well, I've been, you know, hit hiding in shame because I did this, this, and this, Right, but I didn't, I didn't do that. Do that. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and like, and so I think it's disarming for those men to, to be able to, to come out. And you know, the truth is, and this is something I've shared at these screenings, I say this as somebody who is walking in, has been walking for years in total victory over pornography, masturbation. Like I, so, but, but I'm going to say this is that we've all fallen short Absolutely. of our integrity of, yep. our, you know, so like the way I might experience that might be different from somebody else. Um, so I'm not trying to just say, make as an excuse like oh we're all broken so who cares it's like but no it's it's like it's it's just to say that like um to break the shame that that isolates people yes like um i did something bad therefore i am bad therefore i am not going to let people see me yeah like uh father gillick said he he said um this man is just a gem of a human being. He said, we would rather take off our clothes and get naked and have sex and call that intimacy than we would take off our masks and actually be known. <sighs> so there's a lot of self-medicating that's going on that has a shame, an underlying shame component to it. And um, so our hope with this film is to sort of break the yoke of shame mm. that's keeping people in isolation and um and just saying you know hey it, it's it's time for us all to begin to come in the light to begin to have these conversations last night on the panel the most beautiful thing happened this survivor extended forgiveness to one of the buyers who's featured in the film and it was just this really beautiful emotional powerful moment you know, it's that kind of healing that yeah. is made possible when we come out of isolation and shame and begin to open up and begin to engage in safe contexts around these really vulnerable issues that affect all of our lives. That That's incredible. I On that note, I know we got to wrap this up, but I, I think that the conversation that you're having again is so vital in this season. And to me, any any man who's listening to this needs to gather men together to participate in watching this and beginning to, again, like you said, it, it begins to break shame because here you have guys who have gone so far down the rabbit hole in this conversation uh, in the, in the film that it helps guys who haven't gone that far down the road, be able to go, all right, well, I can go ahead and have a conversation about what I am doing because mm -hmm. I didn't do what that guy mm -hmm. did, which mm -hmm. again is, is, is a great way to describe, um, the experience with the film and what it can do because what it begins to do as, as, as you guys are listening and, and potentially going to participate in even watching this film is that it then gives you, um, 
thought-provoking questions that can begin to um, be stirred amongst grown men, but then also be transferred into conversation with sons. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to take men who are willing to get, uh, adult men who are willing to get honest with themselves about their own struggles and about not, not just sexual struggles, but their emotional intimacy struggles, their uh, inabilities to be vulnerable and to begin to acknowledge that between fellow men, but then also bring it into these conversations with the next generation mm -hmm. where you can go, hey kids, I want to, I know you're going to be exposed to this stuff. Let's start having real healthy conversations about how we as men get down the road of participating in it, mm -hmm. what our true needs actually are when it comes to the need for healthy uh, vulnerability and connection mm -hmm. with human souls and processing our emotions. Like mm -hmm. there are real resolutions to this problem because like early on in this conversation, we talked about the enormity of feeling like, how do I fix this whole situation mm -hmm. that's here? And it, is it practically getting involved in the, the hands-on work with exposing things within communities down to the simplicity of like, what if I as a man begin to become so vulnerable in my life that I get honest about my own pain and difficulties with other men? We have these conversations. We help heal ourselves and our and our sons inside of our own communities. And that's how we begin to even chip away at the demand inside of the, the nation, right? Mm -hmm. And inside of the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. that we as men get healing and that as a byproduct gets rid of the demand that exists. A hundred percent. And um, for the parents out there thinking of, you know, their younger boys and girls are now also exposed yeah. to, to porn at younger ages. And that has its own set of implications as well for this. But, um, I, I wrote a book called raised on porn that we just released yesterday. And the second half of this book, so the first half deals with a framing to understand pornography and its impact on our world. And the second half is uh, talks about how to heal and protect our children. And, um, and, and I think that section will be really helpful for parents who are listening to you yeah. saying, I, I would love to have those conversations, but I don't know how. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, or I need to have that conversation with my partner or my spouse or my boyfriend or my, you know, girlfriend, whatever, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the consistent feedback that we've gotten is that this, uh, for the people that we've sent this book out to is, uh, how helpful it is to have those conversations. Yes. And, um, and so, um, age appropriate conversations, you know, for our boys growing up about their conceptions of manhood, masculinity, sexuality is a massive part of ending demand. Yep. And, um, we don't expect parents. There's this like attitude out there that exists. It's like, well, parents just need, man, parents feel, parents feel overwhelmed. Parents feel beat up. Parents feel stressed. They feel like failures a lot of times mm. they f and parents are struggling. So the idea that like, well, now you're just magically going to have the ability to create the perfect conversation, like, no, they're intimidated. And so, um, so just to say, Hey, we spent 10 years creating this resource for people like you to help facilitate those conversations, to give you the tools to have those conversations. Mm. And so, don't put it on yourself to just think, oh, you need to have it all figured out, but get a hold of this resource because it's so important at building healthy males in this pornographic age that we're living in. And again, the book's called uh, Raised on Porn for anybody that wants to get a hold of that. So where can they, uh, if they want to go uh, watch the film, Buying Her, and they want to get a hold of the book, what are the ways that they can do that and connect with you and all that? So people can visit buyingher.com to check out tour dates for our screenings. Um, our main website for organization is exoduscry.com. We have information about everything going on. Um, we have a abolition retreat coming up in Lake Tahoe in August. It's a seven day intensive training. People can see that. And then the, the book is just um, anywhere books are sold. So Amazon, uh, and it's again, it's called Raised on Porn. By Benji Nolo. Man, I really appreciate uh, so many levels of this conversation from the vulnerability to the practicality of what, what's happening inside of it. And, and it's 
so inspiring to think that someone just said yes and the byproduct of that yes has been so many unfoldings of humanity beginning like you saying yes ended up creating an avenue for so much of humanity to begin to understand and see what's happening and then a process of healing is beginning for people mm -hmm. Not just be, not because you had like a, a, a like a plan on how you're going to mm -hmm. do it. It's like mm -hmm. you've been living in a consistent trust fall. And there are people who are listening that like you don't have to know the first steps when you get a burden for something like what Benji's doing. You don't have to understand how you're going to get from A to Z. It's just a, a yes, a mm -hmm. daily yes. Mm -hmm. And going, all right, I'm going to trust that I'm going to get the next step as it's needed. Yeah. And last thing I want to just say for people who are listening to this but not watching it since it's a audio podcast uh, uh one of the things you know as i'm over here you know trying to fight through my emotions to say part of what i want to share you're over there pulling the microphone away and you're over there in tears and uh bawling and i i, I love the the tenderness and the emotional mirroring and the empathy that you carry, it's I think one of the reasons that we always had have had mm -hmm. such a um, um, kindred friendship. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to honor you with your listeners. You're truly unique in the mm -hmm. earth, and I'm so mm -hmm. grateful that you're continuing to facilitate these conversations um, and making healing and wholeness accessible to anyone out there. And so I know I'm going to share this and I hope that, you know, many people, I hope everyone out there gets a hold of this podcast. It's amazing what you guys are doing, what you and Avi are doing. Thank you, man. Well, I love you. And to all of our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. Please like share this. This is, this is a type of podcast episode that needs to be um, spread like wildfire because people need to hear it. People need to actually uh, get the courage that's needed to face these issues. And it's these conversations that are going to impart courage to people to, to run after it, to be authentic, to be honest, to, to get involved in their own heart and to um, really begin to explore these issues that are affecting millions of people. So thanks again for joining us. Um, have a lot of hope about what you're doing, man. And to everybody else, peace out.